Well, we've come to the uh, final hour, and we want to give Michael Rhodes and Richard Draper the last word. So uh, we'll bring them up now, if you'd like to both come up uh, here at the same time. And uh, let me introduce them both briefly. You have heard them already today. Uh, Michael's educational background, uh, he uh, has studied subjects as wide-ranging as classical Greek, engineering, physics, Egyptology, and he and I were in the South German mission together, so German and lots of languages as well. Uh, he, uh, let's see, I didn't mention John Hopkins, Freie Universität Berlin, and Oxford as well. Uh, he uh, uh, has uh, five children, 14 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren, and uh, we've uh, benefited so much from Michael and Richard, thanks to both of them for all the work they've done on not only um, 1 Corinthians, but also um, Revelation, a commentary on Hebrews, and eventually 2 Corinthians coming up as well. Uh, Richard Draper, uh, for your information uh, background-wise, bachelor's degree in history from uh, BYU, master's degree from Arizona State and a PhD from BYU specializing in ancient Near Eastern Roman and early Christian history. He served as the Associate Dean of Religious Education and uh, has published uh, widely on these subjects. Uh, he and his wife Barbara, uh, six children and 15 grandchildren. So we will uh, hear first I think from Michael and uh, uh, his comment, Relevance of Paul's Writings for the Modern Disciple of Christ. Uh, Richard will then speak on uh, the Cup of Blessings, Paul's teachings on the sacrament in 1 Corinthians 10. And then the two of them will entertain questions uh, as long as we'd like to remain. Michael? Uh, before I actually start, I... I wanted to relate a uh, probably apocryphal uh, story, but one that uh, I think is relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, apparently, uh, a uh, young man was talking to an older uh, relative, uh, older female relative, uh, about his studies, and he was studying ancient Greek, and she wanted to know why he was studying ancient Greek, a dead language, and he said, well, I want to read Paul. And her response was, well, if English is good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, Paul, uh, near the end of uh, his epistle to the Corinthians, said, Now I remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel which I preach to you, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast to the message that I preached. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. With these words, Paul clearly stated his purpose in writing to the Corinthian saints. In that bustling city, the word of God had spread, bringing many Jews, Gentiles, slaves, freemen, rich and poor, into the gospel framework and under the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not long thereafter, however, troubles developed. Divisions formed with members separating into distinct groups. These groups squabbled with each other and tried to bolster their positions by claiming loyalty to one or more of the church's leaders. Debate raged over various theological and doctrinal questions as well as practical ones, including how to translate the gospel into daily life. Feelings became raw and widened the gap separating the parties. Dissension had become so great that it threatened to destroy the church there in Corinth. This situation with others prompted Paul to write at least three and possibly four letters to the Corinthian saints. Only two of these have been preserved. First Corinthians, as the epistle is known today, is the second longest of the Pauline corpus of letters. Only his letters to the Roman, letter to the Romans is longer. If, however, we add the size of his second Corinthian letter to the first, it constitutes more than a quarter of the content of all of Paul's epistles taken together. 
In them, the apostle answered questions and objections from friends, skeptics, critics, and outright enemies. In doing so, he left a treasure of doctrinal insights and practical advice as a range of topics. Keep sliding down. But we must never forget that 1 Corinthians is first and foremost a reconversion letter. Paul's purpose was to unite under Christ and his gospel all of the disparate factions. His interest was to bring them together in oneness and love. In short, his major purpose in writing was to reconvert them to the gospel. And isn't that something we all need regularly? A reconversion. Many of the issues Paul addressed have not gone away. The conditions and attitudes found in ancient Corinth have reemerged in the modern Western world. Just like the Corinthians, many have placed their values on gaining wealth, ease, success, fame, and power. Corinthian society, like modern Western culture, was a pluralistic, immoral society whose standards were strictly contrary to those of the Christian community. As Anthony Thistleton uh, so aptly wrote, yep. with today's postmodern mood, we see many compare the self-sufficient, self-congratulatory culture of Corinth coupled with an obsession about peer group prestige, success in competition, their devaluing of tradition and universals, and near contempt for those without standing in some chosen value system. All this provides an embarrassingly close model of a postmodern context for the gospel in our own times. Even given the huge historical difference and distances in so many other respects, quite apart from its rich theology of grace, the cross, the Holy Spirit, the ministry, love, and the resurrection as an example of communicative action between the gospel and the world of a given time, 1 Corinthians stands as a distinctive position of relevance to our own time. Gordon Fee uh, stated it more succinctly. Paul's Corinth was at once the New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas of the ancient world. <laughs> you may recognize uh, New York, New York there in Las Vegas. President Howard W. Hunter the, will, the witness of Paul uh, to the saints at Corinth and the message uh, applies to us in this day, living as we do in a world that can be compared in many ways to Corinth of old, in a society of turmoil, immorality, free thinking, and the questioning the reality of God. We reach out for the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul clearly and concisely addressed the issues of, that such a society faced, and as a result, the Corinthian letters, perhaps more than those of any other New Testament epistles, are highly germane to the saints living in these last days. He explains in a clear and forthright manner the ways in which the members of the church at Corinth had strayed from the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. These include contention, striving for position and power, pride, false reliance on the learning of the world instead of the knowledge that comes through the spirit, sexual immorality. More importantly, he clarifies how to counteract these worldly influences by the applications of the doctrines of the gospel, thereby providing us with some of the most clear and beautiful statements of those doctrines found in the scriptures. Chapter 13, on love. Absolutely beautiful. These include Christ as the... Oh, I didn't put that up, did I? These include Christ as the center and focus of all we do, that the gospel of Christ can only be understood through the inspiration of the Spirit, the importance of keeping ourselves morally pure, partaking of the sacrament worthily, gifts of the Spirit, the true meaning of charity, the reality of the resurrection, baptism for the dead, the three degrees of glory, becoming a new creature through the atonement of Christ, enduring afflictions, and so on. 
I will focus on just two topics that Paul dealt with, which are particularly relevant to us who live in this modern world, whose accepted values are so at odds with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the superiority of God's wisdom to the learning of the world and God's standard of sexual purity. So, let's start with uh, God's wisdom compared to human wisdom. The culture of the Greco-Roman world in which Paul traveled and taught had its roots in the remarkable development in Greece of art, science, philosophy, rhetoric, literature, architecture, and political innovations in the latter part of the first millennium BC. These were in turn adopted and expanded by the Romans and spread throughout their empire. The Corinthian members had begun to interpret the Christian message through the lens of Greco-Roman learning and philosophy and they expected Paul to teach using the intellectual methods they were familiar with. But Paul made it clear that this was not how the gospel of Jesus Christ should be taught and understood. He explained. Okay. My finger doesn't press hard enough. Now, when I myself came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with eloquent speech or wisdom as I proclaim to you the mystery of God. For I resolve not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I appeared before you in weakness and fear and with considerable trepidation. And my speaking and my preaching was not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with the convincing proof of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not be based on human wisdom, but on the power of God. The hallmark of Greco-Roman teaching and oratory was the use of rhetoric, eloquent, polished, and well-reasoned argumentation designed to persuade. In an article entitled Victoriosa Loquacitas, the rise of rhetoric and the decline of everything else, Hugh Nibley convincingly shows that a major cause of the decline of Greco-Roman civilization was their feverish preoccupation with rhetoric. Paul emphasized that he deliberately chose not to follow this practice of the art of persuasion. He explained that the power of God was contained in what he called Uh, the mystery of God, mysterium tu theou. In verse 2-6, Paul clarifies what he means by the word mystery. It describes the sacred, no excuse me, the sacred knowledge which God reveals only to a select group of people, hoi teloi, the spiritually mature. You, this is, by the way, the same word that uh, Christ uses in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, be ye therefore perfect, it's that very same adjective, teleos. Uh, he explained that the power of the gospel was contained in uh, what he called the mystery of, oh, I already did that, teleos. Um, usually through religious rite and uh, which was to be kept secret. The emphasis on its property as something revealed, something too profound to be arrived at through human reason or intellect. Paul's use of the word emphasizes that knowledge of the Christian gospel comes strictly through revelation from God. Paul... Paul did not want the Corinthians to be converted to God's mysteries intellectually. Uh, he says, in uh, Sophia Anthropon, by human wisdom. Such a conversion cannot endure trials and tribulations. True conversion can only come through the power of God. Paul, Paul goes on to contrast the... Uh, oops, yeah, did I get it? Uh, to contrast the wisdom of men and the wisdom uh, with the wisdom of God. However, we do speak wisdom among the spiritually mature. 
but not the wisdom of this world or the leaders of this present age who are doomed to perish. Instead, we speak God's wisdom, which is hidden in a mystery, which God foreordained for our glory before the world was. Paul admits that he does indeed speak a a specific kind of wisdom, but his is radically different from the one with which some of the Corinthian saints have become enamored. His words show us that there is nothing inherently evil about wisdom and using the intellect, but to be proper or correct, it must be guided and informed by the Spirit of God, which the world in general ignores. Such wisdom is hidden in a mystery. As noted above, the Greek term mysterion, unlike the English word mystery that is cognate with it, did not denote that which was impenetrable because it was inherently unintelligible or incoherent. Rather, it pointed to that which was too profound for human ingenuity and could not be obtained by unassisted human logic or reasoning. It could only be by the Spirit. Once disclosed, however, it made perfect sense to the spiritually mature. For those living in the last days, the Lord has promised that as his prophets abide in him, he will give them the keys of the mystery of those things which have been sealed, even things which were from the foundation of the world and things which shall come from that time until the time of my coming. In the remaining verses of chapter 2, Paul explains with penetrating clarity the fundamental differences between spiritually obtained knowledge and knowledge obtained through the intellect. He begins with what appears to be a scriptural quote, but one that is not found in uh, the Old Testament, at least as it exists today. But, But as it is written, that which neither eye has seen nor ear heard nor entered into a person's heart, all these things God has prepared for those who love him. The phrase emphasizes the complete inability of human senses or the power of the human mind to even imagine what God intends for the faithful. Paul continues, But to us... God has revealed them by the Spirit, for the Spirit fathoms all things, even the deep things of God. For what human being understands human things except the human spirit that is in him? So too no one understands the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which comes from God, so that we can understand the things which God has generously given to us, which we also speak, not with words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things by means of spiritual things. Only the spiritually mature, those who love God and are worthy of the inspiration of the Spirit, are privileged to know these things. This inspiration comes through uh, what uh, modern scripture has called the light of Christ. The light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings, which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. The light which is in all things, which giveth light to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. In contrast, Paul stresses that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The adjective, uh, the adjective translated natural is psychikos, 
which in Koine Greek referred to the life of the natural world and whatever belongs to it, in contrast to the realm of experience, whose central characteristic is pneuma, uh, uh, the spirit. The words natural man correspond exactly with King Benjamin's characterization of the natural man as an enemy to God, as uh, described in uh, Mosiah chapter 319. President Joseph Fielding Smith also uh, described the impossibility of understanding the things of God through our intellect alone. There we go. It behooves the Latter-day Saints and all men to make themselves acquainted with the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. But can we through our own wisdom find out God? Can we by our unaided ingenuity and learning fathom his purposes and comprehend his will? We have, I think, witnessed examples enough of such efforts on the part of the intelligent world to convince us that this is impossible. The ways and wisdom of God are not the ways and wisdom of man. How f then can we know the only true and living God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent? For, this, uh, for to obtain this knowledge would be to obtain the secret or key to eternal life. Finally, in the last two verses of uh, chapter 2, Paul brings to a conclusion his entire line of thought that he began by de uh, developing in the 17th verse of chapter 1. But one who is spiritual discerns all things, but is himself discerned by no one. For who knows the mind of the Lord so that he can advise him? But we have the mind of Christ. The natural man, by his self-imposed limitations, is unable to discern and therefore judge things of God and his people because they can be understood only by the Spirit. The spiritual person, on the other hand, not binding himself to the transitory and temporal, can discern godly things. To get his point across, the apostle reworks Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13, turning it into a rhetorical question. Who can know God's mind and counsel him? The implied answer, of course, is no one. Paul's point is that no sensible person would want to match wits with God. The jab is pointed at his Corinthian detractors who are so taken with the wisdom of the world that they have denounced the cross with its, and with it the resurrection. Paul's reproach skillfully shows them that rejecting the cross and saying that God would not work in that way are tantamount to telling God what he can and cannot do. That is real foolishness. With the final sentence of the chapter, Paul explains exactly why he and those who follow him can properly discern and judge. We have the mind of Christ. Here the nuance of the word mind, nous in Greek, appears to refer to the Savior's thought as revealed to the righteous by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Elder Dallin H. Oaks. The Apostle Paul said that persons who have received the Spirit of God have the mind of Christ. I understand this to mean that persons who are proceeding toward the needed conversion are beginning to see things as our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ see them. They are hearing His voice instead of the voice of the world, and they are doing things in His way in, instead of the ways of the world. Continuing this theme then in chapter 3, Paul issues a stern warning to all those who think they are wise. Let no one deceive himself. If any one of you thinks he is wise in the ways of this world, let him become a fool so that he might become truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness from God's point of view, and for it is written, he traps the wise in their own trickery. And further, the Lord knows that the reasoning of the wise is futile. Um, okay. 
God's standard of moral purity. Uh, in chapter uh, chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, Paul gives a detailed list of the kind of sins through which a, uh, that will uh, prevent a person from inheriting the kingdom of God. Prominent among these are acts that deal with the misuse of the divine power of procreation. Uh, pornoi, which means... Uh, uh, basically, uh, sexual uh, uh, fornication by someone who is not married. Uh, the King James uh, Version translates that as fornicators. Those who are sexually immoral probably best catches the modern English sense of the word. The next noun he uses is uh, moikos, which uh, referred specifically to uh, adultery. Uh, that is, uh, a married person who had sexual intercourse with someone who was not his or her spouse. Uh, then he uses uh, two uh, terms that, interestingly enough, uh, uh, especially the second one, uh, is not found anywhere else in uh, Greek literature except by people uh, quoting Paul. Uh, these are... Uh, uh, malakos, uh, uh, which meant basically soft, uh, translated effeminate in the King James Version, and uh, uh, referred, uh, as uh, uh, Craig Blomberg indicated, uh, the passive male partner in a homosexual act, uh, and then arsenokoites, uh, which was the, uh, which is literally man. Uh, uh, this is almost a uh, 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 crude uh, term in, in, in ancient Greek, uh, which is maybe why it, it, it didn't make it into the literature. Uh, the the uh, cruder terms usually don't, but Paul has a, uh, likes to shock now and then and, and hit people between the eyes. But again, this, this uh, Paul by this uh, seemed to indicate the... Uh, active uh, participant in uh, homosexual acts. Uh, the, the key point being uh, uh, the three uh, things that are uh, uh, not acceptable in the eyes of God with re relationship to sexual uh, acts are uh, fornication outside the bonds of marriage, uh, fornication by someone who is married with someone who uh, someone else and their his or her partner and uh, uh, homosexual acts are all uh, uh, equally uh, condemned by God um, now Paul is responding to what seems to have been a slogan bandied about by uh, some of the Corinthian saints there who uh, let me move ahead here quickly uh, he said, I can do anything I want. Uh, and Paul's uh, response to that was, of course, I can do anything, but not all things are beneficial. I can do anything, but all things are not beneficial. Paul is, is talking about the... Uh, God has granted us, if you will, agency to do whatever uh, we want, but has given us strict guidelines of how to properly use that agency. Uh, in the interest of time, let me... Uh, Paul emphasizes that sexual sins differ from all others because our body is a temple for the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. He said, don't you understand that you are a temple of God and God's spirit dwells within you? If anyone tries to corrupt God's temple, God will destroy that temple for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let me read two last quotes and then I will turn the time over uh, to Richard. Um, 
President Kimball, the church stand on morality may be understood. We declare firmly and unalterably it is not an art outworn garment, faded, old-fashioned, and threadbare. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his covenants and doctrines are immutable. And when the sun grows cold and the stars no longer shine, the law of chastity will still be basic in God's world and in the Lord's church. Old values are upheld by the church, not because they are old, but rather because through the ages they have proved right. It will always be the rule. And uh, in the, the most recent uh, letter issued by the First Presidency of the Church in response to the Supreme Court's decision legalizing same-sex marriage, changes in civil law do not, indeed cannot, change the moral law that God has established. God expects us to uphold and keep his commandments regardless of divergent opinions or trends in society. His law Excuse me. His law of chastity is clear. Sexual relations are proper only between a man and a woman who are legally and lawfully wedded as husband and wife. In these latter days, we are faced by the same challenges uh, that uh, li of living the gospel that the ancient saints in Corinth did. Paul's counsel to them applies equally well to us. Careful study and pondering of his writings as clarified and expanded by the words of modern prophets and apostles can aid us in overcoming the world. One, as I uh, enter the uh, uh, autumn of my life, I uh, look forward with anticipation passing through the veil and sitting down with Paul and having a wonderful hundred years or so just talking to that, that great man. I look forward to it. I, I leave that with you in Jesus' name. Amen.